Number 1. Jean-Baptiste In 1862, Brigham Young and his congregation were presented with a problem. After discovering that the gravedigger John Baptiste was also a grave robber, the people of Salt Lake City had to decide what to do with a man who was a thief of the worst kind. Hundreds of sets of clothing were found in his home, stripped from the bodies of the people he had helped bury. Jung reassured his congregation that those who had been buried naked by Baptista would be fully clothed during their resurrection. Baptista's trial seems a pretty cut and dried case. He was ultimately exiled to a barren island in the middle of Salt Lake, escorted there by a handful of men who had been forced to promise that they wouldn't kill him on their way there. Even though the lake was extremely low, Baptiste couldn't swim and he was effectively imprisoned, or so it was thought. Three weeks later, the owners of the cattle on the island returned to check on Baptiste and their herd. Baptiste was gone. The only signs that anyone had been there was damage to the island's only shelter, a small shack, and a young cow that had been slaughtered. Baptiste was never seen again. A handful of different theories have been put forward as to what really happened to him. Some believe that he died trying to make his escape, a theory that's supported by the discovery of a human skull nearby at the mouth of the Jordan River, and later, the rest of the skeleton that was still wearing its ball and chain. Then again, no one seems to know for sure whether or not Baptiste was wearing a ball and chain when he was left on the island. Others suggest that he made it to shore on a raft made of pieces of his shelter and the skin of the cow he killed. Some think that he hopped on a train and headed to California, while others think he made mining towns his home. Later reports dated to well after his exile claim that his ears were cut off and his face was marked with the words, branded for robbing the dead but the truth in those claims is as much of a mystery as his fate. Number two, Henry Plummer's gold. There was no such thing as a background check in 1863. If they'd had such a thing, the town of Bannock, Montana probably wouldn't have elected Henry Plummer as their sheriff. The gunslinger had already been charged with murder, and it was that jail sentence that he was on the run from when he showed up in Bannock. Not wasting any time, he deputized a few of his outlaw associates. His only other deputy, an honest man he'd inherited, had an unfortunate accident involving a hail of bullets only a month later. Right before he settled down in Bannock, he married a woman named Electa Bryan. His marriage didn't keep him from working both sides of the law, though, and he used his position as sheriff to confiscate gold from local miners. Once he had as much gold as a mule could carry, he'd head out to a secret location and stash it for later. There's only a vague idea where he stashed his ill-gotten gains, the treasure's rumored to be in the neighborhood of $2,000 in gold near Birdtail Rock. His wife admitted that he'd stashed another part of his fortune somewhere along a creek that ran into the Sun River. There was a $5,000 haul from a stagecoach robbery that was purportedly buried somewhere along Cottonwood Creek and $300,000 in gold near Cascade. None of it was ever recovered. Plummer was only sheriff for about a year before he became the target of town vigilantes who also ensured the outlaw deputies met their end at the end of ropes. Plummer himself was hanged on January 10, 1864. The knowledge of the location of the treasure died with him. Number 3. Tom Horn and the Murder of Willie Nickel In 1980, Steve McQueen immortalized the story of Tom Horn in his movie of the same name. Horn was a mix of an outlaw and lawman. In the 1890s, the previously lucrative business of cattle ranching had taken a major hit. It had grown much much bigger than its demand, and the rancher's solution of buying more cattle made the problem even worse. Not willing to blame themselves, they blamed cattle rustlers for their hardships and hired men like Tom Horn to take care of the problem, one way or the other. Horn undoubtedly killed men, but just how many isn't known. He was hanged for the murder of Willie Nickel, a murder he probably didn't commit. No one could quite prove his innocence or his guilt, and no one knows who did fire the shots that killed 14-year-old Willie Nickel. After the death of Willie Nickel, Horn's reputation preceded him as far as United States Marshal Joe LaForce was concerned. LaForce was hired to investigate the shooting and met with Horn under the pretense of a job hunting cattle rustlers. Drunk and more boastful than ever, Horn reportedly made some incriminating statements that suggested he'd been responsible for the shooting. It was enough to put him on trial and in spite of the defense arguing that every bit of evidence was circumstantial, he was found guilty and hanged on November 20th, 1903.
Ninety years later, the case was re-examined in a mock trial format, and it was found that it was unlikely that Horn had anything to do with the killing. The details of the fate of Willie Nickel aren't known, but the Nickel family had been part of a long-standing, neighborly feud, and it's suspected that the killing had something to do with the feud. Number 4. Cuejo Cuejo was an enigmatic figure who wavered between serial killer, boogeyman, and scapegoat. Not much is known about his early life, or his life at all, really. He was born sometime in the 1880s, the child of a Native American mother and an unknown father. His mixed heritage made him an outsider from the beginning. His first experience with murder was said to have been when he killed his brother, Avode, for killing another man. He left his home in Colorado and headed to Las Vegas, still a blossoming frontier town, sometime around 1910. It was there that he was completely corrupted by whiskey, and it wasn't long after that his name was used to scare children into being good and dragged up in association with unsolved murders. Within a few years, any mysterious minor death was being ascribed to Cuejo. He soon had a $2,000 bounty on his head and wisely dropped out of sight. In February 1940, a mummified corpse was found in a cave not far from Hoover Dam. Based on its double row of teeth, it was declared to be the elusive Cuejo. His remains traveled around for a while, used as the centerpiece of a Las Vegas Elks replica of his cave, and later stolen, scattered, then recovered. He was finally buried, but it's still unclear whether he was guilty, falsely accused, or perhaps a combination of the two. Number 5. Pancho Villa's Body Parts Francisco Villa, better known as Pancho Villa, made the impressive rise from bandit and outlaw to respected military leader over the course of a few decades. By the end of his life, he was one of the most infamous figures of the Mexican Revolution. He had already retired from both outlaw and military life in 1923, but his successor was worried about his existence, even as a retired rancher. Sure enough, Villa was assassinated. He was buried in Chihuahua, Mexico, at Hidalgo del Paral. Three years later, his tomb was broken into and his body was decapitated. It's never been discovered what happened to his head, but there are many stories and rumors. According to Vila's granddaughter, there was more than just his head missing when his body was disinterred to be moved to Mexico's Revolution Monument. When his remains were moved in 1976, his family says only a few bones were left. It's been suggested that the bones found in the grave weren't his at all, and that his widow had arranged for the rest of his body to be moved after the theft of his head. The body was then replaced with the body of a nameless woman who had made her way to Paral. There was no one there who knew her name, much less anyone that was willing to claim and bury her body. She was beheaded and placed in Villa's grave as a decoy for anyone else who tried to desecrate the grave. So, where did the bones end up? A pawn shop in El Paso claimed to have his trigger finger for some time, and it was for sale for $9,500. According to another rumor, his head ended up in the possession of Yale's Secret Skull and Bone Society, but a potential buyer for the trigger finger claimed to already own the skull of the famous revolutionary. It's doubtful these remains will ever be positively identified as Pancho Villa.